The call to worship today is taken from Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 8 through 9, and other scriptures. Please join me on the bold print, and then we will have a brief time of uh, prayer afterwards. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams which they dream. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And Yeshua answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah and will mislead many. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord, the Messiah, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false. Avinu, our father, oh you're mighty. We adore you even this day, God of gods, king of kings, lord of lords, maker, ruler of absolutely everything, knowing all things. Lord, we confess that we grow slack at times where we don't be watchful and where we also forget that you are God and that you are knower of absolutely everything. Lord, in your word, you warn us ahead of time of things to come, and yet we take them lightly. Oh, Lord, forgive us. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you for your grace. And oh Lord, how we need your wisdom. We need discernment. We need you to help us to understand what your word truly says and how to walk accordingly and pleasing in your sight. Lord, help us take heed to these words even this day. Oftentimes it's challenging when we hear a word from your precious scripture that's challenging and that seems to be harsh, but yet it's great love because you warn us and you care about us and you love us. So, oh Lord, help us take heed to the things that are challenging and also take heed to the things that are pleasant, so to speak. Lord, all of it is your word, the full counsel. So help us to take heed, therefore. Lord, we pray with supplication even now, praying for your Jewish people throughout this world there in Israel and spread abroad. Lord, will you give them ears to hear even this day? In spite of all of the false prophets and the false teachers and the false apostles, Lord, help them to discern what is truly of you and what is not. Let it not be a hindrance to them receiving your good news and coming to you, Yeshua the Messiah, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. So, Father, we pray even now, just asking that your word will continue to go forth, your true word will continue to go forth throughout the land of Israel, even this day at this very moment, that you will bless the men and women of God who are laboring in the vineyard, truly seeking, truly desiring your purpose and your will. Oh, Lord, bless them and anoint them afresh and anew even now to go forth and, and to proclaim liberty, true liberty, unto the captives, Lord God Almighty. And, Father, for the United States of America here, Oh, how privileged we are, but yet we take so many things for granted. Lord, I ask that you would humble us, help us humble ourselves before you, before judgment does indeed come upon us. We pray for the White House, those who are represented there, those who are in Congress, oh Lord, that you would help them to see before it is too late. Oh Lord, how challenging it is to ask these things, but yet this is a part of what you desire for us as a nation to turn in repentance. Oh, Lord, that you would give us repentance, that you would help us to turn from our wicked ways. Your people, which are called by your name, if we will humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways, you promise that you would hear from heaven and that you would heal our land. So even now, Lord, oh, Lord, hear from heaven. 
Heal our land, forgive us our sins, how we've sinned against you in great and mighty ways. And help us as your congregation of believers to represent you well, to truly walk before you humbly, to walk up right before you in a way that is pleasing in your sight, turning from all falsehood, exposing the false prophets, but in great love that the false prophets may repent and turn to you before its destruction, even as your word says. So, oh, Lord, help us to be as the congregation there in Revelation in Ephesus. But yet, let us not leave our first love, our love for you and our love for souls. Help us to be very discerning, but yet walk in tremendous love as you desire. So we thank you so much for this day. We pray for this congregation that you continue to help us to walk in purity. Help the teaching continue to go forth in a pure and in a mighty way. Help this worship team even this day to worship you with all of their hearts, to represent what it is of true worship, true adoration, true humbling of ourselves before you, Lord God. So we thank you so much for this opportunity to worship you, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Avinu, our Father, is through Yeshua, the pure Lamb and the perfect Messiah that we come before you and we ask these things. Amen. Well, as you all, some of you may be aware, uh, Rabbi Sam is out of town serving um, another congregation for maybe the next couple of weeks. Some of you may be hoping for a short sermon today, right, or service today. Not too fast. <laughs> we have other teachers that, uh, that are fortunately capable of filling in the gap. It is my privilege to invite Gary Corredo to the Bima. <laughs> so, well, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. So glad you could join us today. Um, Lord willing, we were going to focus our study today um, on what is true and what is false. Our calling is to be cynical about the Spirit. We're going to read this portion of Scripture together. If you would like to stand, please do so. If you would like to sit, please do so. An equal opportunity speaker. Um, and you will we'll do it all together again. I kind of did what Sam does to kind of, it's, it's a lot of text, so we'll just do it all together. So we'll do it in unison. And, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Yeshua Messiah has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Yeshua is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that is coming, and now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Heavenly Father, we give you praise for you are who you are and how, how you love us eternally, even for who we are. We thank you for the freedom we have at this time to read and study your word. We are thankful, we are thankful people for the provision we have in and through Messiah, our Lord and Savior. Thank you for the text we'll be studying today. May my feeble insights and illustrations be edified, edifying, and may you glorify them in the hearts of those with ears to hear your word of truth today. I pray for the peace of Israel, the unsurpassed peace that only comes through the Messiah, Sar Shalom, and his atonement for our sins. Pray for those of spiritual victory today and quickening of Messiah's return. I lift up those that are hearing this message and do not yet know and trust in you. May their hearts be open to you and to your free gift of salvation. Be with us as we study your word and apply it to our lives this Shabbat. In Messiah's name I pray and give thanks. Amen. Cynically saved. Shalom and welcome to, this, to the study today. We will be exploring the theme of discernment in the context of our messianic faith. As we begin, let us turn our attention to 1 John 4, 1, 6, which we've read, where the Apostle John exhorts us to teach the Spirit to see whether they are from God. Test the Spirit, excuse me. In this passage, John reminds us that not every spirit is of God and cautions us to be discerning in our approach 
to the matters of faith. He warns us that there may that many false prophets and deceivers who seek to lead us astray and urges us to test their message against the truth of God's word. As a Messianic believer, we have a unique perspective on the truth of God's word as we recognize Yeshua, Jesus, for our visitors, as the promised Messiah of Israel. However, even within our own community, we fall prey to counterfeit faith and false teaching. This is why it is crucial that we develop a discerning spirit and test all things against the standard of God's word. Pretty decent introduction, if I do say myself, although it wasn't written by me. I actually downloaded it from an AI program, artificial intelligence, more specifically what they call a large language model. In a nutshell, what that is, I'm getting nerdy for a second, is they basically feed a lot of data and conversations and interactions between human beings into a computer program, and then it learns from it. Pretty soon, we will not be able to discern between content generated, or maybe probably now, generated by AI tools and by human beings. That can be pretty scary if you think about it, not really knowing if who you're talking to or who you're, what you're reading was written by a human or derived by an application. We live in a sophisticated society, um, sophisticated time as well, and technology like these are used to deceive people in a variety of ways. Spam, right? Um, all the stuff in our emails, you could win this, right? We still get the one about the Nigerian millionaire, though, so that one's usually pretty standard, right? Um, think about the telephone spam, and just a few years ago, it was pretty easy to detect, and now they've gotten very technologically advanced and, and quite deceptive. We need to be on our guard. This culture we live in is a culture of deception. It causes some level of cynicism among many people. Some are more predisposed to skepticism and doubt. This is not new. The mechanism may have changed, but the motive has not. It's about deception. We see in Ecclesiastes 1.9, seeking to, uh, what, what has been, it, excuse me, it is, it is what will be, and what has been done, it is what will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. Seeking to deceive and control perception is nothing new. The mechanism may be different, but the purpose is not. We caution our children, our friends, our family members, especially some of the elderly, to be careful in what you believe and who you talk to in our day-to-day -day lives because these things can be uh, quite expensive uh, to deal with. How much more should we caution in what we believe when it comes to faith in Messiah? In Jeremiah, we see part of portion we read this morning, for this is what the Lord of armies and the God of Israel says, do not let your prophets who are in your midst or your diviners deceive you. And do not listen to their interpretations of your dreams, which you dream. He was not cautioning Israel on behalf of God about external threats, like we may do today with these external uh, ideas coming into our homes. But within our midst, the wolf is in the pen, and he's stealing the sheep right under our, the shepherd's nose, and he cannot recognize it. There are numerous scriptures that exhort us as children of God to be on guard. We see a few of them here. The command of John given, uh, given in our portion today is not uniquely his. As we can see, Messiah himself in the first two verses, beware of the false prophets and also no one mis make sure no one misleads you. Paul in the third and Peter in the fourth call, com uh, call command the same thing. As Peter wrote, and we also see in Deuteronomy 13.5, but that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken falsely against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to drive you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall eliminate the evil from among you. We must eliminate the evil from among us. As long as there has been mankind, there has been a desire to deceive them. Let's take a look at today's outline. It's also in your bulletin. We're going to take a look at the purpose for discernment, the source of our discernment, the source of discernment, and the proof of discernment as we look at 1 John 4, 1 through 6, or as much as we can get through in the period of time I've allotted. This could be 30 minutes. It could be three hours. We don't know at this point. Just kidding. It's not going to be 30 minutes. Um, John starts with the present tense imperative, do not believe every spirit. What he, and it's also in the negative. So it's basically literally saying, as an ongoing command, you should not begin to accept as true or worthy every spirit. So you didn't believe before, you shouldn't start now. You shouldn't start now. 
You can ask any youth in your area, actually they're all over there, they're very, very versed in present imperatives. And, and I did mean that pun intently, intended. When I read this verse, um, for who I am, I gen I'm, I'm generally a skeptical, skeptical, except for, actually, I'm very generally skeptical, um, other than obviously the saving grace of Messiah. What I found interesting is John uses spirit, but not prophet or teacher. The phrase could have simply been, do not believe every teacher or prophet. But he's pointing us to a deeper thought. What is behind every false teacher or prophet? As verse 6 says, the spirit of error. John is pointing us to a spiritual war that Paul talks about in Ephesians 6, 11 through 17, about the pulling on the full armor of God. Verse 11, or excuse me, verse 12 makes that exact point that John is. Why don't we read it together? For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces, this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Humans are willing pawns of the evil one to spread, spread false doctrine. The word spirit in the original language means air or movement. It, we can see the impact of air, but we can't see the air, the leaves rustling. In the same way, we can see the impact of the spirit, but not necessarily not the spirit itself. Just as we are called to be led by the spirit, these emissaries of deceit are as well are led by the spirit, just a different spirit. They are successful with those that are not prepared or uneducated. And Paul, Paul writes in 1 Timothy 4.1, read together, but the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. That isn't like if it might happen, right? But it says the Spirit explicitly says we see this time coming. As James prayed, the Word definitely gives us warning. Definitely gives us warning. The postmodern idea of it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe in something is not just foolish, but it's dangerous. To contrast the idea of a believing every spirit, the additional command is to test the spirit to ensure what, it seem, what seems to be light of Messiah is what he is and what he's done. Here's a fun fact, or a nerdy one, I can't really tell the difference normally. Um, this section of 1 John is found between two sections focused on love. Why would John put a section about test the spirit in between sections of love? Maybe he's trying to help you discern that just because a messenger brings a message of love doesn't mean he's of Messiah, doesn't mean he's of God. When we hear about the majority of cults and false religions in these, their speech, their focus usually is on love, not the same kind, not the agape of Messiah, but, of the most effect, but it is the most effective way to draw people away from the truth through the lens of love or concern. It's Hasatan's oldest trick. He did it to Eve in the garden. But the, um, it worked in, for Adam and Eve. John is com uh, commanding a test of the spirit, even its promoting of love in what seems the same way in Messiah's love for us. We could spend all day talking about that particular portion, but we're going to move on a bit. The purpose for not believing and the testing is because many false prophets have gone out into the world. They're all around us. They may be among us. Oh, sorry. Um, these false prophets or teachers use messianic Christian type words and would have you believe in that they also believe in Yeshua, Jesus for our guests. I had a, a co-worker of mine I've known knew for many years, and if you would have asked me if he was a believer, I would have said absolutely, until actually we were out to dinner one night and he literally said, oh yeah, you know, being a Mormon's tough, right? It was because they use a lot of the same language, a lot of the same words, but unfortunately they use them out of context and manipulate it for their personal gain, which is normal. This test John is commanding us is not simple, action, it's simple intellectual exercise. True faith is not a blind leaf, but requires consistent and continual examination. Again, do not believe every spirit, present imperative. Do it now. Keep on doing it. It's not a one and done scenario. I wish some of these scriptures would be one and done. Like I did that already. Let's move forward. But it isn't. Those things about faith in our walk is always continual. Always continual. Right. Yep. 
Um, there we go. Um, we must examine carefully what they are saying and compare it to, against to what we know is true. Anna and Nicholas have a beagle. Say hello to Sawyer. What would be the use of us learning what Sawyer looks like, or excuse me, what would be the use, I'm getting ahead of myself, what would be the use in learning what other beagles look like in the midst of a beagle meetup without knowing what Sawyer looks like? Wouldn't make any sense. We wouldn't know, it's like they would know Sawyer, but I, we wouldn't know Sawyer because we just met him, right? It'd be difficult for us to find him in that, in that group, right? Which one? Every teaching or prophecy is, is measured against God's word to see is it from God himself. I taught a series a bit ago, it's probably online somewhere, about other religions, and the key was whether the teaching, um, whether teaching of core doctrine was of God or not of God. What does that mean, though? What does it mean? If we believe that Scripture is truly God's word, which we do, and there's ways we can test that, test that. Then it is uh, used to compare all others against. Like the real Sawyer, he's our sole reference point of what beagles look like. At least my sole reference point. Uh, notice John's progression of thought as well, though. Do not believe every spirit because many false prophets have gone out into the world. These false prophets are the delivery mechanism for the wrong spirit. John is not commanding us to reject every prophet, but to test them that they are and what they are promoting. Paul states the same thing in 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 and 21. Do not utterly reject prophecies, but examine everything, holding firm to that which is good. We talk, about at, uh, we talk at the point of salvation. Sam talked about this last week. I talked about it with the youth last week. At the point of salvation, three things occur. We are regenerated. We are made alive to God. We are indwelled. This Holy Spirit lives in us to guide us as a resource. And we are immersed, which we join into the death and resurrection of Messiah, joined for eternity. We are sealed. The fourth service of the Ruach HaKodesh is the filling, the influence, that is the ongoing service. That's why you hear people pray, fill me with your spirit as we pray. So the idea is let me be influenced by the spirit as we pray. Those that preach and teach false teaching and doctrine are filled with the false spirit. And that's what we need to test. Mankind simply does not speak out of their own intellectual insights. They are led by something, by a spirit, whether divine or evil. We are influenced by those things that we allow to influence, influence us. So how do we know? What is this test that we need to perform? It's that spiritual discernment. Unless you know what you believe, and I mean know what you believe, you can fall for anything that sounds close enough. I remember when I first got saved, I was raised Catholic. I'm recovered. And I remember sitting in discipleship with, um, with Sam, and he read a, a scripture portion, probably well-known by everybody, 1 John, right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. But in the, in the Catholic Bible, it's, or I'm not the Catholic Bible, the, uh, in another Bible, it wasn't Catholic, um, it said, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was a God. The indirect article, one of many. If we don't use the direct, we leave ourselves open for all nonsense. One little word changes that verse entirely. We have to be on guard and we have to know what we know. We might believe the animal on the left is the same as the animal on the right. <laughs> Obviously, one's a Pixar, I think, and the other one's, I think the other one's also an illustration, but I thought they were funny looking and I needed a, laugh, a cheap laugh might believe they're both the same because it's close enough. Their eyes kind of look the same. They both got a long neck. Kind of one of those things, right? Con artists rely, um, their success relies on the fact that not everybody pays attention to everything. We sometimes shortcut our thoughts, shortcut our ideas, but they don't. They use everything to their advantage in the same way false teachers do. It says... Your performance rating is terrible, Fenwick, but I like, the, I like your looks. They're the same guy, right? It kind of looks the same, and you kind of be fooled because it shortcuts people, right? Someone teaching falsehood can be friendly and kind, loving, and may even know the word of God as well as you do, or even more. The only way 
we fall victim to falsehood is if it looks and feels like the real thing, like a trap. A trap is only effective if it doesn't look like a trap. Or you're stupid. Um, they can cause all things, all kinds of thing, uh, signs and wonders to occur. Even the magicians were able to mirror the plagues to start in, a, uh, in Exodus 7.22. But the soothsayer priests of Egypt did the same with their secret arts, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. So if we're not careful, we can be fooled with our own words if we don't know what we should know. By this refers to what comes after the statement versus before. We will get to that in a second. The audience that John is writing to were versed in the word. You know present tense as well, continual experiential knowledge, muscle memory, those things you do without thinking about it. They knew the word. They experienced it. They were versed in it. So you, can recognize because you, can, you can recognize it based on your experience and you gain knowledge to know. You know. That's what he's saying. You know these things. Remember when you were younger, hopefully when you were younger, and did something you were not supposed to, and you got the, you know better, right? Or I should have known better than to do something like that. That's what it's saying. It's saying you know better through experience and teaching, you know better. That's what John's saying here. You know the Spirit of God based on your experiencing, experience and the teaching you have learned about his influence, control, enablement in your walk. Without it, there is no sound doctrine of truth. You know? The key to truth is Messiah. John points out that every spirit that confesses that Yeshua Messiah has come in the flesh, confesses is, the present tent, is in the present tense as well. It's also continual. Confession is more than just saying, stating, or agreeing, because the demons have done that, who Yeshua is. To confess is to submit your life based on that knowledge of truth that he is Lord and Savior. In Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, we see that if you confess with your mouth Yeshua as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. You know. You know these things. You're blessed if you do them, right, John says. We are commanded to universally test every spirit. The spirit because false teachers are everywhere, and the test they must confess that Messiah has come in the flesh. Let me get this straight. We are to test the spirit, and the test is, do they believe, do they confess that Messiah came in the flesh? Of all the things in Scripture, that's what John chose to say is the test. There has to be a more obvious test or better test than that. What if, I don't know, they proclaim that Messiah is the Son of God? Isn't that a good test of the Spirit? What about they proclaim that they love one another as Messiah loved us? Wouldn't that be enough? There has to be a better test. But John is pointing to the primary doctrine of our faith and hope. Could he be combating something of teaching at his time? Number one, there were heresies being spread after Messiah's death that either, get this, he was not flesh, but he was just a spirit. Because there's no way a Messiah, God, could come in the flesh. He just appeared that way. He just appeared like flesh. Or that Messiah's essence came upon Yeshua, the person, at his immersion. You remember the dove, right? Then at his crucifixion, left prior. John is actually countering these by confessing that he came in the flesh. He's making it a statement, not a question. They must confess that Yeshua has come in the flesh. That's the text. That's the test. If you remember the Good News Count, the Gospel of John, where he translated Hebrew words so the crowd could understand him. For John 1, 3, 38 says, Rabbi, which translate means teacher, right? He wanted them to understand 
speaking to mostly uh, non-Jewish uh, Jewish speaking people, Hebrew speaking people, uh, but also know the importance of the Jewishness of the faith, the reason why HOI and other congregations like us exist. In this case, if Messiah was not fully man, flesh, and not fully God, he would not be recognized as the awaited Jewish Messiah. He would not be recognized by the Jewish people and who, they, who the prophets spoke of. Thirdly, without flesh and blood, there is no atonement for sin. Let me, let me say that again. Make sure I'm clear to those live streaming, because you all are clear. It's the live streaming people I'm worrying about. Without flesh and blood, there is no atonement for sin. You can't do enough. Spirit or essence, get this, they don't have blood. Imagine that. Uh, to sacrifice on the altar. It's a requirement, as we see in Leviticus 17.11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. It's the blood. That's all it is. It's the blood. The sacrifice of animals was a temporary stopgap, but the true sacrifice was Messiah, the once and for all atonement. Finally, also, Messiah coming in the flesh enabled him to not only relate to us, which he could do anyway, but allowed us to relate to him. In Hebrews 4.15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things just as we are, yet without sin. We don't have an excuse. I wish I had an excuse. There's two things I wish I had an excuse for. One, that, right? And two, that he just used normal people to, to live out his word. I wanted everybody in scripture to be extraordinary, so I had an excuse not to live out that way, because I'm not extraordinary. And I wanted, but he uses unextraordinary people like us, like me specifically, to share. So they must confess about Yeshua. Anything less than he has come in the flesh, fail. It's only one question on the test. You either get it right or you get it wrong. The primary doctrine is he was conceived supernaturally by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, through Mary, fully man. Human flesh without sin, fully God. Uh, anyone, anyone that denies the true nature of Messiah is teaching from a spirit of the Antichrist. There is no middle ground. There is no separation from that primary doctrine. There is nothing. Why? Without the blood sacrifice of Messiah, we're all still sinners. Well, we all still are sinners, but we're not saved. We all, there is no salvation. Without God come in the flesh and his atonement sacrifice, we're not saved. No matter the zeal, the knowledge of their own truth, any denial of Yeshua as the word incarnate is false. Primary doctrine and theology matters. It's a difference between salvation and damnation. Man's religion is based on man's arbitrary doctrines and opinions of what seems reasonable and understandable. You can read all about uh, the basic face of other religions, and they're like, well, it doesn't seem reasonable that there's three in one for the triune nature of God. That seems weird, three gods in one. I don't understand it, so it must not be true. God come in the flesh. God is God, flesh is flesh, two different things. There's no possible way. So that couldn't be true. Our mind makes us come up with reasonable responses. God's not reasonable, apparently. How serious is this test, especially among those, uh, for those among us trying to deceive us, not necessarily here, I don't want anybody looking at everybody at Oneg, but in the greater body of Messiah. We read here in Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5, if the prophet or dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or wonder, and the sign or wonder comes true of which he spoke to you, saying, let us follow other gods whom you have not known, and let's serve him. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, and cling to him. But that prophet or dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. I'm going to stop there because that's a good exclamation point. And also eliminate, right, at the end. Eliminate evil from among you. Notice that it is among you. Again, the attack is within, not from the outside. It comes from within the body. The false spirit seeks to integrate into the community to corrupt from within. 
We must always be alert and protect those that are weaker in faith from being swayed by every wind of doctrine, as Paul likes to say. But stick to the truth. Messiah came in the flesh. John gives the spirit a name or connection point. Antichrist, anti-Messiah. He is, the, he, he, here, inf, uh, he is here influencing the world as the lower G God of this world. We know in the end times there will be the, the Antichrist, but in 1 John 2.18, we see children, it is, last, it is the last hour. And just as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. We know because many have appeared. We see the appearance of plural anti-Messiahs as a sign of the end times coming. Anti meaning instead of or against Messiah. Anti-Messiah as it were. In 1 John 2.22 it says, Who is the liar except the one who denies that Yeshua is the Messiah? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. They either confess literally to say the same thing as another and to so agree with another's statements that Messiah has come in the flesh or they are under the spirit of another, of, uh, under the influence of another spirit opposed to God. As I said before, we can be tripped up by simpleness of the faith, trust and devotion in Messiah. Paul wrote it in this way to the Corinthians. But I am afraid that even at the serpent beguiling, even as the servant beguiled Eve by his cunning, your mind may be corrupted and led astray, excuse me, led away from the simplicity of your sincere and pure devotion to Messiah. The ant means I grabbed that from the amplified version. I preferred that version, that translation, just in this particular scenario, because it, it kind of made the point I wanted to make. The simplicity of our faith, sincere and pure. We want to get complicated. This seems boring. I keep reading the same scripture. keep saying the same thing to me. It gets boring. I want something new, something exciting. It's all just the simple part about Messiah dying for our sins. That's enough. In 1 Corinthians 11, oops. yeah, there it is. 2 Corinthians 11. Um, I already read that. Sorry. John proclaimed the rather simple test that it is, that is a beginning basis for apologetics, what we're going through in the youth class right now. So some of you youth that aren't quite youth, apologetics. Anyway, uh, it just basically means defending the faith. The first point in a, in a general apologetics is truth is knowable. It tries to battle against the, the idea that truth is relative. That's a stupid comment. Truth is not relative. Um, but anyway, um, it either is or isn't. Um, truth, is, truth is knowable. Um, and all the youth groan, right? Um, the second may seem obvious, but you'll be amazed on how profound it is. Ready? The second point is the opposite of true is false, right? Right? She, she knows. That seems obvious, but may not seem so obvious. May not seem so obvious to everybody. Um, two opposing ideas, thoughts, doctrines, two opposing ideas, thoughts, or doctrines cannot both be true at the same time in the same way. Let me say that again. Two opposing viewpoints, two opposing quote-unquote truths cannot both be true at the same time in the same way. Either they confess Messiah has come in the flesh, or they're being led by the anti-Messiah. That truth, it either is or it isn't. It can't be both. It can't be neither. It either is or it isn't. The opposing views in the, is the Spirit of God can proclaim that Messiah came in the flesh, or he can't, or he didn't. Both can't be true. That's why all religion cannot be true. There are made way too many opposing doctrines for all to be true. But I digress. Let's move on to 4 through 6. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them. Where John was comparing the spirits in the prior three verses, two verses, John's now comparing mankind, us, as those that know, you know, and those that know the world. He's comparing spirits in mankind. Those that are from God have a resource that is greater than the world. Again, two opposing thoughts. Are you from God or from the world? John is reminding us that we are born again, we who are born again are from God, not the world. Notice the use of the personal 
pronouns. You and we and us. Us, we, those that have accepted the free gift of salvation. John is exalting us to use the resources available to us as children of God and not the resources of the world. They are not for us. Never forget your divine heritage. Messiah works so hard to deliver it to you. You, yes, you. Receive, uh, got all dramatic there. Have overcome them through Messiah's victory over the world. We see that in John 16, 33. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. He has overcome, we have overcome the world through Messiah. Them are the false teachers and prophets and the spirits that influence them. The reason that you have overcome is not only that you are from God, but also that with new birth, being born again, you have received the Ruach HaKodesh. Remember when I said earlier about the indwelling? It allow, if you allow him to reign in your heart continually, being filled and influenced by the Spirit, you will be led by the Spirit and not by the world. No matter what the world says through movies, books, or whatever, God is more powerful than Satan. Greater is he who is in you than is in the world. We have that power in us to overcome, even as we have to live in this world. We all have to live in this world. Again, the, the moment of salvation, we should have been in heaven. But God left us here to be an example, to hopefully be a good example. We see in Romans 12:2. Very common verse, obviously. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. I'd like to be perfect. We won't get there. This is true for all believers. You, it's about you. It's not some special sect of really smart people. All of us who have accepted the free gift of salvation, we are from God. It is true for all believers. 1 John, uh, yeah, 1 John 5, verses 4 and 5. For whoever, whoever has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But the one who believes. That's simple. You mean I don't have to study scripture every night? You should. Right? I don't have to do all these things? You should if you um, serve and so forth. Members, I'm looking at you. Serve. But... It really comes down to the one who believes that Yeshua is the Son of God and has come in the flesh. We can identify those in the world by what they say and who listens to them. Just because a ministry or a congregation has a lot of people, it doesn't mean the message is from God. Just because they have some unique perspective you've never heard before, it doesn't mean it's from God. We are called to test every spirit, every spirit. Spirit. Quantity does not trump quality. The test is what they say about Messiah. That is always the primary. Everything else is secondary at best. A good friend of mine taught a lesson many years ago to keep first things first. That first thing will always be Messiah. That was dramatic. Let's pray. Are you an overcomer? Are you from God? If not, the good news is you can reconcile today with God right now. Be instantly an overcomer. Don't wait any longer. Sounds like I'm selling something. I will say a simple prayer. If it reflects your heart, repeat it with me in your heart. Not that a prayer can save you, but God sees the sincerity of our hearts. He only sees the sincerity of our hearts. Um, it is all he sees. And let's pray together. Dear God, I'm sorry for my sins and ask for your forgiveness and reconciliation through the atonement of Messiah. Thank you for loving me and saving me forever. In Messiah's name I pray and give thanks. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, we have some information in the back at the table over there to the right. Walk up and say, I prayed the prayer. And they got some resources for you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I hope this is a blessing to you as it was to me. Shabbat shalom to you all.